Hello and good morning. You're looking at a live view of Starship, the world's most powerful launch vehicle and by far the biggest flying object ever made. We're currently at T plus 31 minutes and 24 seconds awaiting our third flight test of Starship from Starbase Texas, or what we here at SpaceX like to call the gateway to Mars. Thanks for tuning in. We're excited to be joining you from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Now it's just been a hundred, you can tell the crowd is already excited behind us. Now it's only been 117 days since our last Starship test. And for those of you following along, you'll know there's nothing more exciting, as you can hear, than to watch a de developmental flight test. That's absolutely right. Flight test days guarantee the maximum level of excitement, as you can hear behind us. And if it all goes well, Starship will lift off just uh, about 30 minutes from now. We're hoping to surpass what we achieved in flight test number two back in November of last year. But regardless of today's outcome, the goal is to collect as much data as possible, and that'll help us get one step closer to a fully operational Starship. Now, Starship, which you see on your screen, is the latest and largest vehicle developed to date by SpaceX and in the world ever. Compared to Saturn V, the rocket that first took astronauts to the moon, Starship has more than twice the thrust, and with some upgrades that are planned for the future, it'll have three times the thrust. Starship will allow us to fly the heaviest payloads ever flown, land humans on the moon again after more than a half century, and ultimately fly humans further into space than ever before, even to Mars. But the most important thing about Starship is that it's designed to be a fully rapidly reusable, reliable rocket, or what we like to call the four R's. And we'll talk more about those later in the webcast. But before we dive into the details of today's test, let's recap the achievements of our last integrated flight test, Flight 2. All 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy booster started up successfully and for the first time completed a full duration burn during ascent. As you can see here, we saw amazing views of each Raptor engine burning during that ascent, which is something awesome because we don't get to see that with Falcon and its Merlin engines. Now, next, Starship executed a successful hot stage separation, powering down all but three of Super Heavy's Raptor engines and successfully igniting the six second stage Raptor engines before the vehicle separated. This is the first time this technique has been done successfully with a vehicle of this size and scale. Following separation, the Super Heavy booster successfully performed its flip maneuver and initiated the boost back burn. However, about 30 seconds into that burn, it experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly or rut. That's SpaceX speak for an exciting end to the booster's journey. The likely cause was determined to be filter blockage where liquid oxygen is supplied to the engines. So we've upgraded hardware inside the oxygen tank to improve filtration capabilities in our boosters, including the one that's out on the pad today. Vehicle breakup occurred more than three and a half minutes into the, into the flight, about 90 kilometers over the Gulf of Mexico, so well away from people. Now on Starship, the six second stage Raptor engines all started successfully at separation, and everything was going normally in the ship's climb to space until about seven minutes into the flight, when we began a planned vent of excess liquid oxygen propellant. To simulate the mass of a payload and get future focused data, the ship was loaded with extra propellant that we needed to get rid of or vent before re-entry. Once we started venting though, a leak developed that caused fires, which eventually cut the connection between the flight computers on the ship. And that caused the six Raptor engines to shut down before we had finished the full burn. That was detected by, as a mission rule violation by the autonomous flight safety system, which triggered a, the flight termination system and led to vehicle breakup. Starship's second flight test nearly completed its full duration burn. It ended at an altitude of about 150 kilometers and a velocity of 24,000 kilometers per hour, officially making it the first Starship to reach outer space. Like the booster, we've made upgrades to Starship's upper stage based on Flight 2 learning, such as improved leak reduction, fire protection, and changing the operations to increase reliability. Now, back at the launch site, the new water-cooled flame deflector and other pad upgrades performed as expected, so the pad required minimal post-launch rework. And that's a big reason why we, why we are ready to fly again today. The ground support systems are designed for rapid turnaround of the launch pad between flights, and the improvements we've made ahead of Flight 3 are getting us closer to that goal. And that brings us to today's test. 
The test profile and the burn timeline are very similar to test number two, with one major difference. The ship will attempt to splash down in the Indian Ocean rather than the Pacific. This puts us on a steeper trajectory than past flights and lets us taste cap test capabilities that we'll need for the future, like lighting a Raptor in space while maximizing public safety. So let's take a closer look at the flight test profile. Now, about 26 minutes from now, Super Heavy will ignite its 33 Raptor engines and lift off from Starbase. About three minutes into the flight, Super Heavy's booster will separate from the ship in SpaceX's second ever attempt at a hot stage separation. That means it'll light its engines while still attached to a partially lit booster. The ship's engines will then remain lit for about six minutes during the ascent before entering a coast phase. Next, the booster will perform a flip maneuver and execute a boost back burn, which, if you recall, is where Flight 2 Super Heavy experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly. We're hoping hardware upgrades made for this flight will get the booster closer to executing a landing burn in the Gulf of Mexico. In the meantime, Starship will coast for about 30 minutes at altitudes between 150 and 235 kilometers, and the ship will attempt to fire a single Raptor engine for our first ever relight of a Raptor engine in space. And from there, the ship will head toward its destination, a splashdown location in the Indian Ocean. Again, if we get past a successful stage separation and a full ascent burn with the upper stage, it will be at an added altitude and trajectory below orbital, meaning Starship won't have to fire its Raptor engines for a deorbit burn, and it will naturally come back into the atmosphere no matter what. Now, meanwhile, the Super Heavy is going to attempt a landing burn before splashing down into the Gulf. And while we are going to practice a landing, we aren't planning to recover any of the hardware from Super Heavy or the ship on this flight. Now, with the exception of Falcon, this is no different from what happens with most rockets flying today that are expended or fall into the ocean after they complete their mission. Eventually, though, we will land and recover Starship boosters and ships, just as we do with Falcon 9 and Heavy boosters, where we've recovered 283 to date. Starship's rapid reusability is key as we begin missions to the moon and beyond. Even though recovery is not planned, the telemetry and data we receive all the way to the end is what we're looking for, particularly with regard to the ship's temperatures during re-entry and how the heat shield will perform. The data that we gather today, of course, will help us continue to build a rapidly reusable Starship for the future. Now, much like our first two flight tests today, also still just a test. Our goal is to gather data to continue iterating and ultimately uh, improve Starship. That's exactly right. The primary goal for flight one was to clear the pad, and we did that and got a lot of great data that helped us improve the vehicle and the pad infrastructure that you see today. The primary goal of flight two was to get all the way to stage separation, which we did and even got a little extra. For Flight 3, we've added some ambitious tests highlighted by an attempt to transfer several tons of propellant between the tanks inside Starship itself, as well as the first ever relight of a Raptor engine in space and the opening and closing of Starship's payload door. When Starship takes astronauts to the lunar surface as part of NASA's Artemis program, it will be refilled in space by a Starship tanker spacecraft before boosting itself into a lunar orbit, like you see here. Transferring a large amount of cryogenic liquid in space has never been done by anyone, ever. So uh, we'll be looking to get data on some of the fundamental physics in play here, like managing pressures, temperatures, uh, propellant settling, um, now all as we prepare for eventual ship-to-ship -ship transfers. The ability to refill starships once in orbit will be critical for landing on the moon and is a key technology for enabling deep space exploration and ultimately flights to Mars. Now, we're also attempting the first ever relight of a Raptor engine in space, and we'll need that capability for future in-space maneuvers and deorbit burns. It's important to note that what we'll attempt today is not a burn required for Starship to re-enter on today's test. We are intentionally flying this new steeper trajectory so we can test things like engine relights without substantially changing where we expect to splash down. And if Starship manages to make it all the way to re-entry, we will collect valuable data on the vehicle as it flies through the Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, or more than five times the speed of sound. We expect it'll look something like this animation on your screen with the heat shield tiles facing down. We'll use the Earth's atmosphere to break the vehicle and then get us into a controllable regime as we go towards splashdown. 
that we did validate Starship's ability to fly inland at subsonic speeds during our suborbital flights several years ago and gathering data on the aspects like heating and vehicle control while we're traveling way faster will become critical to eventually bringing Starships back from space for rapid reuse. We'll also attempt to open and close Starship's payload door for the very first time, a capability that we'll need when Starship starts flying our next generation Starlink satellites. And there you can see an animation of what that will look like as the satellites are deployed one by one through a slot near the top of the spacecraft. So at this point in time, we are approaching T minus 21 minutes until liftoff. Let's check in with Dan for a countdown update. Hey, thanks, Kate. Hey, everybody. I'm Dan Hewitt. Good morning. Welcome to Starbase. I'm coming to you from the Raptors Nest, where I'm here with some of our flight controllers, also our pad red team. Uh, we're just behind the Mega Bay. Those are our super heavy boosters right behind me, getting ready for the next four flights after this one. Uh, so we're looking to launch a lot this year. Uh, countdown has been pretty clean so far. We're not tracking any issues that are gating us on the hardware side and the vehicle side. Uh, from that on-time liftoff at 8.25 a.m. Central Time. That's our T0 right now. We primarily shifted later as we were just working to clear the range. Uh, the other big watch item today is going to be the winds. The winds uh, have started to pick up. We're still looking to be below our limits, but there could be a hold at T-minus 40 seconds just to make sure that the winds are acceptable before we go. We are actively loading propellant on board the vehicle. You can see by the frost line starting to build up. Looks like we're about 80% on the ship main tanks right now and a little over 60% on the booster. Now, Starship uses uh, liquid methane as its fuel, liquid oxygen as its oxidizer. Both of those get cooled down to uh, cryogenic temperatures, so several hundred degrees below zero. And if you followed along with our previous two flight tests, the prop load timeline today looks a little bit different. Those first flight tests, it took us about 90 minutes to load all of the prop on board. But since the second flight, we made some pretty significant upgrades to make that time shorter. We added some additional fuel and LOX pumps just to increase our capacity. We expanded the number of heat exchangers and installed a dedicated fill drain line for each stage. But they were sharing one before, and now they each have their own. That's just that main pathway to get the propellant to the vehicle. We're aiming for about 51 minutes for today's operation to fully load prop. We did that successfully on our first on our wet dress rehearsal that we did recently. Eventually, though, we're trying to get that time down to about 40 minutes just for some content context. That's about five minutes longer than we take on Falcon 9, but we're doing it with 10 times the amount of propellant. Now, the propellant load on ship started at about T minus 53 minutes booster right around T minus 42 minutes. Uh, we are about to pause loading on the main tanks of ships, switch over to the header tanks, and then switch back to close out the main tanks. We're expecting all of the prop to be on ship at about T minus 3 minutes 30 seconds, and then booster prop load ends at T minus 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Now, our final countdown and startup sequence is going to be the same as Flight 2. We already tested this on this booster when we did its static fire. Looking back for Flight 1, we lit those Raptor engines on the booster and lifted off about six seconds later. Flight two, we reduced that time by almost two seconds. That just helps reduce the stress on the ground systems, improve the efficiency of the rocket. But right now we're just about to pass 18 minutes away from launch. Winds again, they're still looking a little bit marginal, so we'll keep an eye on those. We're not working any other technical issues and the range is expected to be green. If we can't make our test today, we have backup launch opportunities in the coming days. Could be 24 to 48 hours, all just depends on how far we get into the count. So check back in with everybody in just a little bit. For now though, I'm gonna send it back to Kate and Shiva out at Hawthorne. Thanks, Dan. The countdown is continuing to progress, so let's take a closer look at the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed. Starship is comprised of two elements, the ship, which has six Raptor engines, and the super heavy booster, which has 33 Raptor engines. Starship is capable of about twice the thrust of the Saturn V rocket, and with future engine upgrades, it will actually be three times as more, three times more powerful. Now, with those future improvements, that'll allow Starship to carry somewhere between 150 and 250 metric tons to orbit, depending on the configuration. 
For reference, Falcon 9's heaviest payload to date is just over 17 metric tons. So with Starship, we're talking about an order of magnitude greater in terms of payload capability to orbit. And that matters because the amount of mass we're able to launch per rocket is critical to creating a self-sustaining city on Mars. In terms of size, the Super Heavy booster alone stands about 71 meters or 233 feet tall and is about the same height as a fully integrated Falcon 9. The ship stands about 50 meters or 160 feet tall. Stacked together, the booster and the ship are by far taller than the Statue of Liberty, which stands at 305 feet tall with its base. Stacked together, Starship is 396 feet, so uh, quite a bit taller there. Now, Starship's first stage has a diameter that's about two and a half times that of Falcon 9. And when we've got those 33 much larger Raptor engines, this, this great view of the launch mount looking up at those engines. And we need them to power through the Earth's atmosphere and gravity to deliver those massive cargo uh, and payloads up to space. Moving up the rocket, Starship is designed for vertical takeoff and landing on any hard surface. And that's as opposed to taking off and landing on a runway as aircraft do. And that's important because there are no runways on the Moon and Mars where we're going. The ship, which we're looking at now, features six Raptor engines. Three of them are sea level engines. Three of them are vacuum engines. That means that those vacuum engines are optimized with a larger engine nozzle to operate in the vacuum of space and get us higher performance. The ship is also outfitted with four flaps to help aerodynamically control the vehicle's attitude during atmospheric flight and enable a precise, uh, pre, excuse me, enable a precision landing. The body of Starship is also wrapped in a heat shield made up of 18,000 hexagonal ceramic tiles. Those are designed to insulate the vehicle during atmospheric entry, where temperatures can be as high as 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. One of our test objectives today is to verify how Starship systems and thermal protection system tiles perform during reentry. And in between the first and second stages is our hot stage, which is critical for our newest separation technique, which we saw in action during flight test two. Yeah, that was a pretty exciting first for our team. Hot staging had never been done before as part of a reusable, reusable space transportation system, let alone on a vehicle with the size and power of Starship. Now, at about liftoff plus two and a half uh, minutes, the booster shut down most of its 33 engines, leaving just three of them running. And then the ship simultaneously ignited all six of its engines. Some clamps separated and the ship thrusted away. That was the first in-flight test of the heat shield. And we were able to gather a ton of valuable data about hot staging. We maximize the vehicle's performance by leaving three first stage engines on. So gravity can't rob us of precious velocity or at least not as much. Hot staging also helps to ensure the ship's liquid propellants are at the bottom of the propellant tanks, which is where we need them to be in order to quickly light the ship's engines. It also reduces risk at stage separation because it creates a passive staging system so that physics will be doing the work instead of mechanical parts pushing the two stages away from each other. Ultimately, hot staging could increase Starship's payload to orbit capacity by 10%, which directly translates to more payload and more people to the Moon and Mars. Now, the first stop will be the moon, and the SpaceX team has been hard at work proving out all of the systems necessary to make that possible. Critical systems for propulsion, life support, and even the elevator that you see here, which will take crew and cargo from the Starship hatches down to the lunar surface, are currently in development. And the data that we gather from each test flight helps inform their design. Here we've uh, got a photo of some of the mock-up suits that are used to demonstrate the range of mobility that uh, astro astronauts will be expected to have. And we were using these to do human factors demonstrations and figure out the layout of the elevator. So all awesome development work for a future moon mission. Super cool. Now SpaceX will perform one uncrewed demonstration flight before NASA's Artemis III mission, which will be the first human surface expedition since 1972. After those first expeditions, we'll be ready to fly more people along with everything it takes to build a moon base. There's so much to look forward to. It's incredible that humans are finally going back to the moon. You couldn't have said it better, Kate. And the moon is just the proving ground. It's just the start. When the time comes to make the leap to Mars, everything ramps up by orders of magnitude. The logistics of supporting an entire city on Mars are daunting and will require millions of pounds of cargo 
flown from Earth and spread out over thousands of launches. And today's flight test is one more step toward that ultimate goal. We're currently at T minus 11 minutes, 47 seconds. Let's check in with Dan once again for a countdown update. Hey, Kate, uh, still still good news from down here at Starbase. We're not tracking any technical issues that are going to block us to a launch. Our T0 time still holding to 8.25 a.m. Central, so just about 11 and a half minutes from now. Uh, the real thing we're going to keep an eye on is the winds once we get there. We do have that potential hold at T minus 40 seconds where we can hang out and either let winds die down, make sure we're in the right structural limits, everything like that. Uh, so don't be surprised if we do a hold at T minus 40. We've done those on previous flights, uh, but we are not tracking any technical issues. The range is going to be green for launch, so all that really great news. Uh, we're still loading propellant on the vehicle, on the ship. We're just about done loading the header tanks, the two smaller tanks in the top, uh, and then we'll go back to the main tanks. They're about 85% full, and then booster, both fuel and locks, over 80%. Um, so looking good there. Uh, the launch pad itself is getting ready for liftoff. We commanded the booster hold downs open already about 20 minutes ago or so. Uh, and then that just means that once that rocket has sufficient thrust to overcome its weight, your thrust to weight ratio goes over one, it's going to lift off. Uh, we don't have a command to actually release the hold downs once it starts up. Uh, just also a reminder, actual liftoff happens a few seconds after you see those engines ignite. So you'll see fire and then a few seconds before Starship really starts to take to the skies. Uh, our range team just going to keep on making sure land, sea, air are all clear as we really count down. But that's the latest. We're just coming up on 10 minutes before launch. Everything looking good for Starship's third test flight. It's also back to you guys in Hawthorne. Great. Thanks, Dan. Now, if you've been following SpaceX over the years, you've no doubt heard us talk about our goal of full and rapid reusability. Nearly all of the Falcon boosters flown last year and this year have been reused, or as we like to say, flight proven. We've landed Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy boosters 283 times since first doing so in 2015. And with Starship, our mission is to take reusability even further by reflying both stages with little downtime between flights. And we, ply, we plan to fly as often as possible. As we mentioned earlier, rapid and complete reusability is critical to enabling routine spaceflight. The team at Starbase has been hard at work developing and manufacturing the hardware that will ultimately take humans back and forth to the moon and Mars. Now, even though we are not recovering Starship today, test flights like these provide the critical data that we need through every phase of flight. <laughs> and that data informs future missions and gets us to that future where Starships are being recovered and rapidly reflown. Our teams are also working on the ground systems that will support rapid reusability. When we start recovering Starship boosters, we'll want them to return to the launch site for a quicker turnaround, as you can see here uh, depicted in this animation on your screen. This is when the tower reveals its dual purpose. After launch, the arms or the chopsticks on the tower will help guide the booster into position to ensure a soft landing. Now, if you're thinking that this sounds hard or even impossible to do, well, that's the inspiration for naming them Chopsticks. Some of you might recall a little film called The Karate Kid, where Mr. Miyagi famously taught the main character, Daniel, that if he could reach, excuse me, that if he could catch a fly with chopsticks, he could accomplish anything. Now, today we do have four ships and four super heavy boosters built with more coming off the production line. As our star factory continues to grow, these vehicles are slated for future flight tests just like today's. And in fact, just this week, we static fired our next ship that's planning to fly and expect to test the booster as soon as the launch mount is free from today's flight test. Uh, now, as a reminder, today is still just a test. While we really hope to get our splashdown location in the Indian Ocean, but any data received will help us improve. It's the third of many future flight tests for Starship before it becomes fully operational. And that's the goal of flight tests. They teach us about the limits of our design and improve our understanding of the vehicle and ultimately help us make Starship more reliable and rapidly reusable. So whatever the outcome and however far we get, we can promise excitement. And things look like they are moving fast at Star, uh, Starbase, uh, and, and that's exactly how we like it. Yeah, Rapid, exactly. Uh, iteration is, is a key of SpaceX. Yeah, uh, we've done it with all of our major innovative advancements, including Falcon, Dragon, 
and Starlink. Uh, we believe that if you're not failing, you're not learning and improving the design. Yeah, many of the innovations that we've developed have come from our failures, and they teach us how to avoid the perils of spaceflight. It's a, it's a tough business. But all of this testing, all of the iterative design allows us to make the design better and better to do some of the great accomplishments with reflight that we've had so far. Exactly. One of the examples that we love to talk about is the Dragon capsule, like the one located behind Shiva and I here uh, on the mezzanine. Originally, it Originally, it was uh, 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 you know, not designed to be reusable. We wanted to prove the initial design. And then when we brought Dragon 2 online, we had to do a lot of corrosion analysis based on flights that had splashed down and analysis on hardware received there. And now our Dragons are uh, reusable and uh, also rapidly at, at a much rapid pace than they used to be. Yeah. So, I mean, great learnings from the, our original Dragon to our new crew and cargo vehicles have directly improved the operations, and they've helped us change our understanding of what's possible when it comes to rocket and spacecraft reusability. Now, uh, we're just under T minus six minutes, so I think it's another good time to check in with Dan for the rest of uh, Terminal Count. How are we looking, Dan? Thanks, Shiva. We're looking good. Five minutes, 35 seconds, and we're counting down. We are just about at uh, closing the prop load sequences on booster and ship. Just a reminder, ship, we're going to close out at around three minutes and 30 seconds, booster at about two minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, once all of that prop is loaded on board, we'll have about 10 million pounds of propellant on both stages uh, of Starship. Now, after that happens, we'll go through a couple of different procedures with the ground. We'll do what's called pushbacks, clearing out the lines between our prop farm and the vehicles themselves before we get to launch. Uh, and then in the next few minutes, we'll get the final guidance system alignments, some final thrust vector control on the booster checks, uh, and all that will be performed. And again, if we need to hold, we have a hold gate built in at T minus 40 seconds where we can hang out. Uh, it sounds like today we'll have about 15 minutes to hold at T minus 40 if we need to. Uh, if we hit that right now, it looks like the most likely reason would be winds. We're not tracking any technical issues to our T0 at 825, just about four and a half minutes from now. So, I mean, everything's really looking good. The, the booster's almost at full frosty, so we'll see that close out in just a couple of minutes. But we are, we're getting really close to flight, guys. The excitement is definitely growing here uh, in Hawthorne, SpaceX headquarters. There is a large crowd gathering. You might hear them cheering occasionally. Um, now, Dan men mentioned a good point about the holds. Uh, we have an opportunity to today hold for a few minutes. Um, and, and this is a really cool thing about Starship. And we don't have this opportunity with Falcon or Falcon Heavy. Um, up, into, up until the T minus 40 second point, Aborts are just holds. So anything that would trigger an abort prior to T minus 40 seconds becomes a hold. So that's a really cool feature to allow the team to wait for final checkouts or assess prop levels, engines, avionics, vehicle pressurization. It's really helpful to ensure a liftoff. Yeah, and, and that's something that is a little, that is very different from Falcon. I'm sure people have watched our launches and then we get right down past prop load and then have to scrub because of weather or scrub because of an issue on the vehicle. And we don't have the same constraints on our propellant and our system with Starship, which gives us more availability in the window. And sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes the winds dip just enough where you can launch the rocket safely. And otherwise, if you didn't have that ability to, to hold a few minutes, you might miss that window and then have to recycle to another day. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of like today, uh, like we mentioned earlier, winds are the thing that we are watching. So. Um, good news there. So we we are still continuing to progress. We're looking at liftoff in just under uh, almost two and a half minutes from now. Uh, super exciting. Like we said before, there's nothing more exciting than watching a test flight for a developmental program. And that's where we're at today. And like we talked about, we have some really ambitious goals for today's test. But really, the point of today's test is to try to get as much data as we can so we can inform the next iteration of the design of Starship, 
work those in those things into flight test number four and new objectives there that'll eventually get us to that glorious, rapid, reusable future that we, we so badly want. <laughs> yeah, for flight one, we wanted to clear the pad and we did. For flight two, we wanted to get through hot staging separation and we did. So today we want to get even further than that and collect as much data as we possibly can. So with all that being said, we're going to check back in with Dan uh, to take us through the final two minutes of terminal count. All right. We are under two minutes away. We are just, we have closed out the prop load on the booster and on the ship. And we're starting to hear some good news that it looks like winds are not going to hold us up. So there's a good chance we blow right through that 40 second hold. So we're about a minute and 20 seconds away. Just walking you through one last time, we're going to see the engines ignite about four seconds uh, before we hit our T0. They're going to ignite in three different banks. You'll get 13 of the inners, 15 of the outers, and then the last five ignite just two minutes before T0. And then after that, the quick disconnect will retract. The, the engines will start to throttle up, and then we'll see liftoff about a second and a half after T0. So we're under a minute away. Don't be shocked if we hold at 40 seconds before, but it sounds like the winds are cooperating today. And we'll be able to move right past that, not tracking any other technical issues that could Proceeding hold us. Proceeding past our KD van gate. Through the QD van gate, past the 40 second hold. Flight Director Ty Huntington telling the team we are go for launch, so 20 seconds to go. Let's listen in. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 3, 1. seconds into flight we are feeling the rumble we are seeing 33 out of 33 raptor engines ignited on the super heavy booster booster and ship avionics power and telemetry nominal acquisition of signal corpus christi we're continuing to get good call outs our trajectory Matthew. looking nominal systems looking nominal just amazing to see all 33 lit up once again At this point, we've already passed through max Q, that maximum dynamic pressure, and passing supersonic. So we're now moving faster than the speed of sound, getting those onboard views from the ship cameras. Now, the, the next major milestone is going to be a hot staging maneuver. Again, we're going to be doing that in just about 90 seconds. To do that, we're going to shut down all but the three center Raptor engines on Super Heavy. That'll be our Miko, our most engines cut off. And then the clamps holding the two stages together are going to release. Starship second stage will ignite its engines, the RVAX first, the sea levels right after that. The sea level engines will be splayed or just kind of pointed out at about a 15 degree angle so if you look close and we get good tracking you might be able to see those center right after and so those six engines will push starship off of the booster all right counting down now we're going to be coming up right at around the three minute mark on that hot staging maneuver Again, we'll see the booster engines start to shut down. You'll see all but three lights go out in the middle. 
And then we'll see the engines ignite on ship, pushing it away. And that will start carrying the ship into space. Booster will start to do its flip and then move into the boost back burn, setting it up for eventual splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Hot staging confirmed. Booster's now making its way middle. back, okay. seeing six engines ignited on ship. Kate, we got a starship on its way to space and a booster on the way back to the Gulf. Oh, man. Uh, I need a moment to pick my jaw up from the floor because these views are just stunning. Uh, these are live views from Starship. Uh, first stage is currently performing. The ship boost avionics, power and telemetry nominal. Good there. News informing us that the second stage or the ship, everything looking good, nominal there. First stage is currently performing the boost back burn, expecting that to last about one minute. That boost back burn, uh, that boost back burn propels the booster back towards the coast, taking it to a landing in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we're uh, only using the super heavy boosters, 13 center engines from here on out. Uh, as whenever they relight, you'll be able to see that in the left bottom corner. Uh, those are the ones that can gimbal. In other words, they move and change direction uh, in order to change the thrust to steer the first stage back to Earth. Wow, these are just incredible views coming to us. Everything is looking good for both the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen or the super heavy booster as well as on the right-hand side of your screen, that is Starship, or we also refer to that as the ship. Now the boost back burn uh, was the first of two burns required to return it to Earth. The next one will be the landing burn, where all 13 center engines will initially ignite and then transition into a three engine burn uh, to help slow it down. Now just as a reminder of the stage one test objectives, uh, we're looking for controlled ascent, which we have so far. Uh, stage separation, which gorgeous, we cruised right through it, uh, as well as on a nominal trajectory. Good news there, telling us that the path that Starship is on uh, is good. Now, Starship's second stage is still firing its engines, and as you heard, following planned flight path. Uh, the ship objectives, we're looking for hot staging, again, cruised right through that. We're looking to demonstrate controlled ascent as well as orbital insertion. Now, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen shows the ship uh, engine graphics, so be sure to keep an eye on those. Yep, Kate, like this is just a, a phenomenal test so far. Super Heavy is performing beautifully today. It's on its return leg of the journey ship continuing to burn its six engines, those larger circles, the Raptor vacuum engines, the inner circles, the uh, Raptor sea level engines. We're ab about 30 seconds away, uh, just under 30 seconds away from the start of the boost back burn. Uh, excuse me, the landing burn on the booster. You can see the grid fins rotating. Those hypersonic grid fans are guiding us through the atmosphere back towards our splashdown site. Again, we're going for a hard uh, for a splashdown, a soft splashdown. So for landing burn, we're going to expect to see the 13 center engines light, rapidly bring down the booster's velocity, and then just the three in the center for splashdown. Let's see if that'll work. We're getting a few, a few engines. And acquisition of signal. Let's see if we can get some other video of that. Now, uh, this is a test objective today. It is still something that we're attempting to learn. Um, and to make it that far to demonstrate the controlled re-entry up to that point is pretty darn good. Ship continuing to look nominal with its ascent burn. This burn lasting uh, about six minutes total. 
And we're expecting that this burn will end uh, just after T plus eight minutes, about a minute from now. So far, though, I mean, congrats to the team. Making it this far is farther than, we, than we've gone Absolutely. on flight two. Just wonderful views and great engine performance from the vehicles. So far, we've hit controlled ascent. We're in the middle of that right now. We demonstrated the hot staging. Kate, as you said, cruised through that. Uh, we demonstrated controlled entry of the, the booster. Just yeah. dropped a little short of the engine relay, but hey, that's something we can learn for the next one. Yeah, now that view that we just had moments ago was a live shot of Star Command. There you see it again. This is uh, our mission control center at Starbase. Uh, where vehicle operators are standing by. Now, the next milestone coming up uh, is in less than a minute. Uh, at that point, ship will, or I'm sorry, it actually, it already has. Um, engine cut off. There we go. <laughs> Starship's six Raptor engines have successfully shut down. We heard a call out for nominal orbital insertion, which is incredible. Look at these views, Dan. Uh, I'm just completely blown away right now. Uh, what a day. Congratulations to the entire SpaceX team. I mean, this, this flight pretty much just started, but... <laughs> We're farther than we've ever been before. We've got a starship, not just in space, but on its coast phase into space. Just to recap where we've come, and it's only been nine and a half minutes. How has it only been nine and a half minutes? We left it off right on time at uh, 8.25 a.m. We didn't have to hold at our gate at all. We had 33 out of 33 Raptor engines open up. Uh, and light and get us through a nominal ascent, another successful hot stage, all six engines on the ship propelling us into orbit. We did see a not, uh, what looked like a nominal boost back burn, uh, and then we did make it all the way to the landing burn this time. Didn't light all the engines that we expected, and we did lose the booster. Uh, we'll have to go through the data to figure out exactly what happened, obviously, um, so we'll be on the lookout for information about that, but uh, wow. Uh, a ship in space. We've got a bunch of, as we said, ambitious objectives ahead of us um, over over the next couple of minutes and pretty much over the next hour where we're going to really, we've got the ship in space. We're now going to take advantage of this and try and learn as much as possible about some of the other systems, uh, including that first ever Raptor Relight in space. So it's just going to be incredible. So all of that still to come. The mission just started, but wow. Uh, what what a liftoff! What a what a hot stage! What a what an amazing sight to see Starship there in outer space. I, I can't believe we're seeing it in <laughs> in space. This is awesome, wonderful. And now we are going to be coasting for uh, the next about thirty minutes or so. <laughs> we'll be back around the T plus forty minute mark, and that'll be uh, Starship continuing to coast, hit those ambitious test objectives, and then continue on to reentry. We're not totally sure what video that we'll get since that normally comes to us as we overfly ground stations and we, we don't have a ton of those 